Hello there, friends and neighbors. Thanks so much for coming back to my channel. This is me, Stella Hendricks, and I am back with another Playboy review. This one is May 1958, the Country Club Playmate. It doesn't actually have the date on the front there. I think some of these older ones, they didn't do that. And it's not a really super hidden bunny head. He's up in the corner, even though he got a little messed up. Dear me. <laughs> So these 1950 ones, they're also significantly smaller than the ones we see in like the 80s and uh, beyond in the 60s and 70s. They got enormous. Uh, but that's okay. That means that we can go through it uh, a little more closely. So that is very fun. One of the first things whoop, right in here is the Dear Playboy. I thought this was interesting. All the various opinions on Jane Mansfield. Your February playmate, Cheryl Kubert, would look sexy in a sleeping bag. Mansfield has to resort to nudity. Please stop featuring big-bosomed, expensive Hollywood types. Give us more of the girl next door, like Cheryl. I prefer the girl next door, next door look myself to like the super Hollywood glamour look, but eh, they're just different looks, right? Different strokes, different folks. Cheryl reminds me of my kid sister, and Liz Roberts was just as bad. Let's have more buxom, healthy, sexy females, like Mansfield. <laughs> These are all uh, from different letters. Cheryl Huber is the first all-girl girl we have ever seen. I don't think she is. <laughs> Boy, is Cheryl a dish. I love that old saying, a dish. Miss Cubert is, without a doubt, the most appealing girl who has ever appeared in Playboy. Huh, what a compliment. The buck has been made, counted, and deposited. Jane has put on her clothes, smoothed her goose flesh, and gone back to Muscle Beach. Swell. I love that one too, swell. Photographs of delightful damsels gas me as much as they do anyone, but publicity-seeking, gourd-breasted, slack-hipped, slack-jawed, what is slack-hipped? Slack-hipped, slack-jawed broads with grotesquely protruding, gnarled, becorned feet? Lying on beds of mangled mink, these friends do little for my libido. I don't really care if a girl is famous or not. All I see is the girl. Please, back to pretty girls. No nudes next month of Ethel Barrymore! <laughs> Listen, Ethel Barrymore has every bit as much a right to be naked as Jane Mansfield. <laughs> Jane Mansfield is the most perfect specimen of womanhood ever displayed in your terrific magazine. So, the moral of this story really is, uh, don't worry about your kind of beauty not appealing to this guy or that guy or the other guy because it doesn't really matter. Someone pointed out to me once that, you know, as long as it'll hold still long enough, most men will have sex with it. They find it sexually appealing. So don't worry about making yourself appealing to guys. Just be your kind of sexy and the right guy will find you. Women are not meant to chase. Men are supposed to be the chasers. That's what I have to say about that. And it's just hilarious, all those different opinions. And that guy who went off on corn breasted, be corned feet. <laughs> that guy was a riot. Oh my gosh. All the jazz albums. Let's see, I'm a sucker for all these old ads. I love them. Look at her fabulous Chanel looking suit. How civilized this guy look how civilized he is <laughs> everybody with the side part back in the whoop, there went my speaker everybody with the side part back in the back in the 50s is killing me oh this music for swingers ah! wait where is it there it is I don't think that swingers meant exactly the type of swingers that, you know, became so popular with Hef in the 60s, I think is when they started using that term. 
If you don't swing, don't ring. I think this is a different kind of swinging. <laughs> Nothing makes a woman more feminine to a man. I liked that advertisement until I had that last part. We're just gonna, we're gonna go like this. <gasps> Nothing makes a woman more feminine, except for maybe that black dress with like those pearl straps. Ooh, I'm gonna make a dress like that. All right. So they always have um, different uh, works of fiction in here as well. Um, of course, I can't read all of them. There's one later on that I am gonna read because I thought it was particularly interesting. <laughs> These great cartoons and illustrations. Whoop. Good heavens. Wizards of a Small Planet article. The race for the moon is old stuff to the science fiction boys. So this is 1958. I think we went to the moon in 59? In 60 something? With it, I don't think we're to the moon yet at this point, which is wild to me. Cause that's something I've just always kind of taken for granted in my life. We've always, you know, there was a man on the moon when I was born. So it's just very cool to find uh, artifacts from back in the day and to hear people talking about uh, going to the moon in this kind of like sci-fi type way. Whereas for me, it's almost like a historical event. You see two very opposite things, sci-fi and history, you know? Playboy's Little Acre. Okay, so I'm gonna go over another one of these similar articles soon. But this actress, she looks so much like my friend, Sheba, Queen of the Night, which is her burlesque name, of course. Especially in this picture, for whatever reason. Ah, oh no, I'm always roughing up the covers on these things. In this picture particularly, she looks a little bit like Liz Taylor, who is gorgeous. And yeah, Sheba looks a lot like Liz Taylor. So, oh dear. <laughs> you mean all the way from 23rd Street to Central Park? <laughs> no! Okay, this is pretty cool. I like this one. The Life and Death of a Spanish Grandee by Ken Purdy. A year ago, on the 12th of May, a Ferrari automobile running in Italy's Mila, Mila Miglia race crashed in the village of Guidizolo near Brescia. The car had been making something over 150 miles per hour and it killed nine spectators lining the long road. It killed the co-driver, Edmund Nelson, and it killed the driver, a Spaniard named Alfonso Cabeza de Vaca y Leighton. Carval y Are. Oh, that's still his name? Oh my god. Conde de la Marajora, 12th Marquis de Portago. Fucking A, that's a long name. He was 28. In the days after Portago's death, a standard picture of him was quickly established on the front pages of the world's newspaper. An immensely wealthy aristocrat, charter member of the international set, an infatigable pursuer of beautiful women, and a man obsessed with the wish for an early and violent death. Portago would have laughed, I am sure, reading his obituaries. Two months before he died, he had laughed when I had repeated a columnist's remark about his death wish. It's so ridiculous, he said. I'm sure I love life more than the average man does. I want to get something out of every minute. I want to live to be a very old man. I'm enchanted with life. But no, long, no matter how long I live, I still won't have time for all the things I want to do. I won't hear all the music I want to hear. I won't be able to read all of the books I want to read. I won't have all the women I want to have. I won't be able to do a 20th of the things I want to do. I want to live to be 105 and I mean to. I love that. That's exactly how I feel. Like I would put my signature at the bottom of that quote. Stella Hendricks, absolutely. Oh, here's kind of cool. Uh, what to wear while making like a guest, spring house party. 
Of all the delightfully romantic social occasions invented by man, none has the glamorous excitement of the weekend house party in the country. Yeah, these delicious convocations, big enough for the rovingest eye and intimate enough for delectable dalliance, share the traditional glamour of an ocean cruise and offer much more too. There's some gaiety and conviviality of social rooms and lounges that one finds shipboard, but at the weekend house party, the group is smaller and handpicked by the host instead of by anonymous travel agents. The private goings on in state rooms are matched by the cozier room to room visiting and the comparative shortness of the precious weekend hours more quickly dissipates the chillier barriers. Everyone's bent on fun and there's a conspiratorial air of promise from the moment the guests foregather. I love the way they write in the 50s and I also really love these illustrations which are by this guy who does a bunch of them here, Leroy Neiman. That's who. This particular one, it really, whoa, it really reminds me of like, like Degas or uh, not, uh, Toulouse Lautrec. This 100% reminds me of one of the Lautrec paintings from uh, the Moulin Rouge or the Rue des Moulins or, you know, all of those great uh, Parisian uh, establishments which he frequented, shall we say. Just what kind of a girl do you think I am? A contortionist? <laughs> yeah, having sex in cars is kind of difficult. Happy as a clam, a mischievous mollusk's piquant personality on the land, on the sea, on the table. I've heard that these are supposed to be aphrodisiacs, right? They are not aphrodisiacs. The only reason that people think they're aphrodisiacs is because they look like vaginas. Gray vaginas. <laughs> I do not find them particularly sexy, but hey. I also love back in the day, they used to have a lot more of these like recipes and stuff. How to cook the clams, like a fancy Playboy reader. I love that. I love, I think the 1950s uh, Playboy, the magazines themselves are my favorite. The photography of the 70s is my absolute favorite. But I think the content of the magazines in the 50s and like the early 60s is probably my fave. Here we go. Oh yeah. Country club cutie. Miss May is a fetching fixture at million dollar Knollwood. Doesn't she look like a movie star? She also looks a little bit like she's going to see the Pope. Don't you have to wear some black thing on your head if you go see the Pope? I think you do. I don't know if that's true. Any Catholics out there, let me know if that's true. <clears throat> Rough winds do shake. The bar, the darling buds of May contended that wordy fellow from Stratford. But Knollward Country Club in Granada Hills, California is not Stratford. And few rough winds turn up here to distress such darling buds as Laurie Lane, our May playmate. Laurie, a member of the exclusive Pleasure Town, takes advantage of the many opportunities for funsies offered within its swank d-e-m-e-s-n-e-s -E -E dems dems i don't know that word i have to look that one up she digs the ultra modern swimming pool the 150 acre golf course the spacious dining room and cocktail lounge and all the rest of the splendor she shares with bob hope george goble eddie and debbie fisher and other members of the Million Smillion Project. <laughs> what? On these pages, you'll discover Miss Lane enjoying a few strenuous sets of tennis on the Knollward courts. You'll discover her also deliciously dewy after a revitalizing shower in the ladies' locker room, an attractive area out of bounds to all males, save those who read Playboy. <laughs> Laurie Lane above refuels between tennis sets. Below, she delivers a stinging overhand smash. Tennis is only one of Nolward's fun features. All 
All right, you ready for deliciously dewy Lori Lane? This picture is so much like a uh, Surrey Marsh's picture where she is also stepping, I think here she's stepping out of the shower and in uh, Surrey Marsh's she's stepping into it, but they're same like kind of view, uh, the side booby, the bathroom vibe and all that. Although look, okay, at her booby, that looks a lot to me. Nowadays, I would say, oh, it looks like she's got implants. Now I can't see the whole shape of the breast and so it's really hard to tell, but it looks a lot like a breast implant, which I was thinking, wait, this is 1958. I'm not sure that they had breast implants then. I feel like those kind of got invented in the 1960s-ish. I know that uh, they kind of got started as far back as the 40s. I think that's when they started doing injections into breasts to make them look a little bit bigger but I wasn't hundred percent sure. So I looked it up and what I discovered was, uh, bra stuffing with falsies became popular, but many women wanted to do something more permanent. Surgeons in the 1950s began experimenting with different types of materials, including wool, ox cartilage, <laughs> and ivory balls. Ivory? Like real ivory? I guess it is biological material, isn't it? To implant within the breasts. One of the most popular was the polyvinyl sponge. This sounds alarming. So apparently back in the day, it was a thing. Uh, how those ended up, you know, looking is uh, possibly up for debate. But it sounds like they were possible if you really, really wanted them you know, at your own risk. How did a guy like you ever get into this line of business? <laughs> All right. The birth of the Broadway show. I just love this pictorial. And later on, something very hilarious happens. Oh, first we have to look at all these pictures. So, ugh, damnation. Damnation station. Look at what's happened. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> look, there's a coupon for Father's Day. <laughs> that is amazing. Okay. So we're just gonna look at these behind the scenes photos of an upcoming Broadway play. Look at her outfit. Gorgeous. Where was, ah. Oh. Love is hell, shrieks a chorus girl far left as she seemingly bears her breasts. Actually, the exposed bosom protruding from within twin fox head mouths is a realistic rubber. <laughs> like there she is. <gasps> Boobs. I don't know what play this is, but it looks fantastic. What's the name of this play? I'm sure it says in here. It's called Oh Captain. That's what it's called. Oh, and also I love her outfit over here. She looks great. Well, it's been fun, kid. And if you ever get over to Harrisburg, Harrisburg Pennsylvania, be sure to give me a buzz. The limber lips of Elga Anderson would probably have a tough time forming that gloomy greeting, hello, sadness. But, nev but the never used translation of the book title, Bonjour Tristesse, bye-bye, sadness, 
would be a much more characteristic utterance for Miss Anderson. Miss Anderson is a laugh-loving pixie type, given less to morbid moods than to swimming in a state of nature. Nonetheless, German-born born Elga graces the screen version of the Francois Sagan book, playing one of David Niven's multiple mistresses, Denise by name. Though her role in BT is small, the editors of this journal were struck by her ebullience and beauty, and we lost no time in rounding up for your delight the, Will the Willowy Bob Willoughby photographs on these pages. <laughs> Boy, that's a tongue twister. <laughs> Bonjour filming, director Otto Preminger teasingly dubbed Elga Zippo because she had commented that she considered buttons far more romantic than zippers. <laughs> I disagree. I like zippers. You know, I guess buttons, you know, they, it takes a little more like time and effort or something, but zippers down and then up and then slowly, torturously down, whatever. Zippers are so sexy. Elga, you're killing me. Okay, so now we have some men's fashion. Ladies, pray tell, based just on looks alone, who would be boyfie? I looked them all over and they look pretty similar to be honest with you, but I decided on this chap here. He can be my mistress. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> Look how happy he is when he left. <laughs> this lady's great for the complaints counter. Whoop. Okay, this is so funny. Dashing new mono cap for all outdoor sports distinctive monogrammed cap with a nautical flair for both men and women. Ideal for boating, fishing, camping, vacationing, etc. Looks just like the Hef hat, which I don't think he had adopted quite yet. <laughs> but you can see where those, uh, the, uh, that taste came from, certainly of its era. You know what, I'm just going to show you these ads because they're fun and we're almost done. Ooh, men's underwear. <laughs> Oh, and the pipes too. It's so 1950s. Somebody, I think in the 70s, once criticized Playboy saying it was unbearable 50s kitsch. And I kind of have to agree, but except for the unbearable part. I love it. It totally is 50s kitsch, but in the best way possible. Hey, just like, you know, at the beginning of this magazine, some people thought that Jane Mansfield was the hottest thing they ever saw in their life. And some people thought, that, you know, they couldn't stand the sight of her. You know, everybody has different taste. So that's the way that goes. Oh, I know what I was going to read. Yeah, and these old ones, they always have on the back Playboy's International Date Book, which is like this delightful little like editorial snippet of some uh, world traveling business, which I find escapist and delightful. So <clears throat> on the southern slopes of the Pyrenees, the running of the bulls will be held in Pamplona, July 7th through 13th. Everyone and his third cousin is free to hop into the ring with the big bad bulls, just like Errol Flynn did in The Sun Also Rises. Or, if that isn't your cup of tea, 
you can tote your phenol back to your hotel back balcony when the 6 a.m. rocket signals the loosing of the huge black murias and watch them rage through the narrow streets, hot on the heels of the local daredevils. Later, with your sash, Basque beret, wineskin, and your own version of Lady Brett, you can mingle with the crowds and participate in the dancing, jousting, clowning, and what have you. Much of the same sort of circus takes place in Portugal at the Fair of the Red Waistcoat at Villa França de Hera, July 14th. A restaurant in the old palace there even provides a private bull ring in which you can square off with a young quarter pound or quarter quarter pound <laughs> quarter weight, which is 300 pound bull with padded horns and encounter guaranteed to help you work up an appetite for the house's hefty hundred or $1.25 dinner. Wow, an expensive dinner. That kind of reminds me of the rodeo when they have everyone riding those mechanical bulls. <laughs> That's my fave. Any place there's a mechanical bull, I will show up and I will beat everyone at bull riding. Just so you know. <laughs> if place names like Tigna Burish in the Kyles of Boot set bagpipes skirling in your soul, Hi thee to Scotland's tight little western isles, the Hebrides, where the crafty, crafty crofters loom the dandiest, where the crafty crofters loom the dandiest woolens and tweeds your eyes ever did see. There's no trick either in buying a couple of bolts at staggeringly low prices, sending them home for your own tailor to whip into shape. For a scant two dollars and fifty cents, you can board a mail boat to Oban and be your own Boswell during the one day sail to the wee towns of Iona, Staffa, or Tobermory. Very delightful. Next month, photographing your own playmate, plus a complete feature on the latest photo gear and gadgets. Silverstein in Italy, the beard meets the boot. <laughs> Playboy on the Town, San Francisco, is excitingly explored in the first of a smart new series. That actually sounds pretty cool. So, thank you so much, friends and neighbors, for joining me for another vintage Playboy review. Again, this was May 1958. I love the 50s. And uh, I will get back to you again very soon. I think the next one will be 70s era. I can't promise that I'm ever going to post these at a regular rate. I'm just going to post them when I post them because I'm crazy and undependable and so is my life. So <laughs> thank you so much for joining me here, friends and neighbors. It's been a delight. I can't wait for next time. Don't do nothing I wouldn't do. And I'll catch you on the flip side. <laughs>